Good morning, everyone. Kerasoft Technology would like to welcome you to our ServiceNow Federal Tech Talk. Build, deploy, and enhance low-code mission applications quickly with ServiceNow's creator workflows. At this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to our speakers. Team, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, Kerasoft. Uh, this is Derek Rose. I am a uh, creator workflow solution sales uh, representative uh, for the federal space. Um, we do have our partner Veracity with us today. They're going to walk you through one of the implementations they did with a customer. We also have some solution consultants on board as well. So any types of questions you might have in any of those three areas, please let us know. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, we'll be happy to share this deck with you after the uh, presentation. Uh, just drop uh, a line. You might want to take a screenshot of this slide. It has all our contact information on it. Be happy to share that with you. Uh, I joined... Um, ServiceNow just about a year and a half ago, but I started my career as an Air Force officer uh, at Scott Air Force Base building a logistics system that was written in COBOL. Uh, spent the rest of my career um, uh, after Air Force, some civil service, and then at uh, companies like Oracle, IBM, Adobe, and now with ServiceNow. And when I found out uh, or learned about the platform approach to computing, to writing software, I was just astounded I hadn't heard of it before because I've been uh, in this area for decades. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I've really enjoyed the, the concept. And um, when I found out that you could build code so much more quickly, so much more safely and, and risk-free, uh, it was just something that I really uh, took a liking to. And uh, being able to build something up to four times faster. And if you look at the Gartners or the Foresters, uh, you'll see that that's, what, that's their estimate. That, that's not mine. Uh, so again, if you want to take a quick screenshot of the screen, please do. And Fernando, could we go to slide number two? So why would you want to use low code? What is low code, by the way? So we talk about platform computing. Uh, the platform, uh, the ServiceNow platform, uh, has a lot of features and functions that you don't have to build yourself, that you don't have to maintain. It, it's kind of it's, its own cloud environment, um, has a lot of capability, which you'll see in some upcoming slides, but it's ideal for modernization, migration. You hear hyper automation thrown around a lot these days. This is a, a full service breadth and depth platform that helps you get there much, much more quickly. Uh, you work with both uh, pro developers, what we call a traditional IT developer and mission developers, which are your super users, the people you work with building these applications out, but they also have the same uh, accesses and the same ability to help build their own code. Uh, and Veracity will tell you a little bit about that during their section of the presentation. Uh, this visual environment has a lot of pre-built templates that are reusable and integrations out of the box. Uh, it's a, a faster development environment because it's so it's very collaborative and very visual. Lower risk. So one of the things programmers say, and I, I think back to my COBOL days, documenting code. Uh, it's self-documenting. Uh, it's very easy for somebody to pick up where somebody else left off. So if a programmer moves on to a different uh, to a different role, function, company, um, somebody else can pick up right where they left off. Uh, you can reuse and share these workflows that you build out. So if you have uh, elsewhere in your organization or outside your organization, once you build the code, it's yours. Anybody who owns the platform, owns the workflows, can actually ex execute those in their own environment. Um, finally, and, and one of the big points I want to make here, this is really important, and I know everybody who's out there in a the federal space, governance, change management, big out there. Um, a lot of the questions that, that were asked up front by, by new customers is, well, how, what, what are best practices? Uh, you know, what, how do we do this? You really need this change management and governance capability in order to manage this. Because uh, I told the guys yesterday, it's a pretty cheesy line from, from Spider-Man, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Because you can build virtually anything so quickly and anybody can get in and, and get their hands on this, you need a way to manage that. So we're going to be showing you uh, a capability that we have added to our to create a workflow uh, vertical to help you do that. The things that your management's going to want to hear, you know, reduce costs, reduce costs. Uh, and what you'll hear about from Veracity as well is at higher user, user satisfaction. When the users are involved from, from stage one all the way through, if you think to, uh, it just occurred to me this morning in office space, uh, the one character who hands off the requirements from the users to the programmers, um, you know, that's the way things were done. I know it still works that way some places today. Um, and that's the disconnect. So a requirements document is written on the mission side, it gets handed off to the IT guys and they, who, do, who do their best uh, to try to interpret and implement those capabilities. But there's always a disconnect there if they're not working directly together. Creator workflows brings them together in a single environment to, to have them work together from start to finish. Fernando, next slide. 
So I'm going to just cover really, really briefly uh, the two components of Creator Workflow. So App Engine, which is actually the development tool, and then Automation Engine, which is where our integration and our RPA, Robotics Process Automation capabilities reside. Next slide. So those of you who already own a ServiceNow product, you, you've probably seen a slide like this before. So we have four vertical workflows. So IT workflows, which is where we were born. So ITSM, IT service management, a lot of, maybe we're, we're over 50% of the market there. So a lot of you are probably familiar with that. But we also have employee workflows. That's where your HR type applications reside and customer workflows. Um, at, all of those have been built out with, if you look to the right in the blue box, App Engine. They were all built with that tool and they're all, they continue to be maintained and enhanced with creator workflows. So it says creator workflows here. I call them mission workflows because the, mm -hmm. the three verticals on the left, those are more of your business type applications. Creator workflows focuses on your mission. And if you see uh, the, the other parts of the slide, you see a lot of the integrations and you'll see some of those a little bit more later. But if you look just below the yellow and blue boxes, you'll see some of the capabilities that are built into the platform. So the workflows that are already there, machine learning and AI, uh, reusable data models, security compliance, those are already in the platform don't have to be maintained by you. Uh, they're automatically upgraded with each iteration of our release of the platform. Next slide, please. As you can see, you know, IT workflows, there are two dozen IT workflows. Those are actually custom apps built with App Engine. So, and they, and you, by their names, you can kind of tell what their functionality is. They're, they're perfect for what they do. Um, employee workflows, the same thing. There's a dozen there, HR being the biggest one and customer workflows as well. Um, case management is a big, uh, one of the big ones over there. Um, the, the thing is they're, they're, they're built for those purposes. A lot of people will buy what we call the pro or enterprise versions of those, which lets you dip your toe into the pool of app engine. It gives you a, a capped capability, a limited number of tables where you can customize any of those apps just for your specific use case. But when you're building out brand new mission apps, applications, those are actually built in App Engine. So you, you need to, and you see in the blue box, you'll see app, under App Engine, App Engine Studio, one of the biggest components there, Integration Hub and RPA Hub under the Automation Engine side, and App Engine Management Center, which I said I, I will spend a little bit of time uh, uh, on in an uh, upcoming slide. Next slide, please. So I, I, I'd like to draw your attention to create, integrate, automate, orchestrate, kind of the four pillars of when you build out custom applications. So create, that's what uh, App Engine does, that App Engine, App Engine Studio, those type things. Integrate is, is done with our integration hub. Automate is done with our, our RPA hub. And finally, orchestrate is that App Engine Management Center. Now, if you look at the top of the slide, you'll see the, the different stakeholders that participate in the development process. So in the middle, your IT developer, that's your traditional professional trained programmer. Uh, but you see the business developer, that's another key stakeholder. You might call that a super user. Um, those become what we call citizen developers, or I call them mission developers as part of the collaborative uh, software development process. Um, and if you see the, the very bottom of the, of the white box, that, that building governance becomes really, really critical in managing this, this infrastructure. Uh, and available to you out of the box, again, that's all, this, all the things that you get out of the box with the platform. Next slide, please. This is just a screenshot and Fernando is gonna show you a lot more of this later. And each of the uh, subsequent speakers will introduce themselves and their backgrounds. Uh, but that's uh, the visual interface, that's where you start. And that's what makes things so intuitive and so repeatable and very quick to learn as well. You can become a certified ServiceNow engineer uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's only like 10 hours to get a system developer just, just up and running. So it's very intuitive. Um, <clears throat> easy to learn, uh, easy to pass along your expertise to other people. So that's where the, the pro developer and the citizen developer come together. Next slide, please. App Engine Management Center. There is a terrific video out on YouTube for this. It's seven minutes long. It walks you through the entire thing. Uh, but this is the, the tool that helps you do your configuration management, change management, uh, app intake, co collaboration, deployment tasks, pipeline monitoring. You set your guardrails. You can apply standards. You can monitor compliance. But that seven-minute video, just put in those four words. Well, App Engine Management Center in YouTube. It'll be one of the first hits you see. Really good. Seven minutes long. Uh, worth, your, worth your time. Recommend you, you go out and take a look at that. Next slide, please. These are just common cases. These, these are just uh, things that we've seen 
repeated in the customer space, but this is just um, the tip of the iceberg of things that you can build with App Engine. Uh, these are some of the common ones that have slowed people down over time. You see task management, the second one. I, I imagine you probably know of at least you know half a dozen task uh, task tasker systems in your environment or that you've worked with uh, over over time. Constant challenge, uh, form automation, everybody has that. Um, government forms, as you know, change pretty frequently. Uh, anybody who's been in the cleared space, uh, you know how much fun it is to maintain your clearance and keep filling out those, those forms as they migrate. Uh, but repeatable processes, you know, things, things that are labor intensive, things that are uh, error prone, these are the things that you really want to look at to try to put under uh, creator workflows. Next slide, please. So this is Automation Engine. This is the other half of Creator Workflows. I uh, spoke about this before. So Integration Hub, um, that's where you do connectivity to other, uh, could be applications, services. Uh, there are almost two, or there are over 200, what we call spokes, Integration Hub with spokes, over 200 spokes already there. And those are APIs, those are services, those are protocols. Um, and if there's anything out there that we haven't already built, it, it's very easy to build a REST SOAP based hub on your own or uh, some, excuse me, spoke on your own. Um, but there, again, there's over 200 out of the box and we're doing the same thing with RPA hub, which was introduced during the last year. Uh, we are putting repeatable, reusable components in that as well. Uh, some, some new bots are being built, just had a briefing on it yesterday, uh, but you will see that library uh, grow out as well. But virtually anything you can think of that that's uh, more mainstream, uh, system, database, software. We probably have a spoke for that already. Next slide, please. And you're not gonna be able to read this in, in the amount of time I'm gonna spend on it, but there you can see you know, all, all the clouds, um, DevOps, um, all your different collaboration tools are out there. And if you get onto the business side, your financial ERP, already have those spokes built uh, out of the box. And we, we interface with, uh, even though we have our own RPA capability, you can see we interface with the other leaders in that market as well. So we're not, uh, we're not saying you have to do everything on us. Uh, we're perfectly happy to integrate with whatever you have. And most government organizations have a lot of stovepipe systems still out there, whether those are databases or applications. Some of them are on uh, disparate networks, makes it a little harder too. The common platform lets you draw those together, whether you migrate uh, the data onto the platform or not, doesn't matter. Uh, we will talk to them, uh, those capabilities through these folks. Next slide, please. RPA Hub is new. As I, as I mentioned, uh, we're building out more bots as we speak. Um, it's less than a year old on the platform, but um, the uh, there are a number of uh, bots being built out as, as we speak. Um, several of them were, were discussed yesterday yesterday in an internal meeting. Next slide, please. This is just a sample set of some of our customers that are out there, but pretty much you, you can't swing a cat without hitting us out there in the uh, federal or public sector space. Uh, but these are um, some of the ones that are you know, very um, eye-catching, I guess I'll put it that way. Um, but if, if you have any other questions on any other accounts, I'm sure we can connect you with the people who have our product in those accounts. And I, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Joe uh, from Veracity. They're going to walk you through an implementation that they did uh, and, and show the, the benefits and their lessons learned um, success, success story as they walk through it. Next slide, please. All right. Thanks, Derek. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, my name is Brian Prosser. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Veracity Consulting. And I have with me Joe Walters who's one of our senior ServiceNow certified developers. And uh, my background is, is really over the last couple of decades uh, working in enterprise software and consulting. And um, prior to that, uh, I was actually in mechanical engineering. I was, we were kind of joking around with the ServiceNow team that a lot of us came from the world of developing in COBOL and, and Fortran. So, you know, we certainly have a, a special appreciation for low-code, no-code platforms at this point in history. So um, we're, we're very excited about uh, these capabilities. So why don't we start with a little bit of background on our customer, the USDA, and some of the recent changes they've experienced. And then we'll dive into the project details and how it transformed the way that the USDA does business. So if, if you're not as familiar with the USDA, they're one of the largest federal civilian entities with 29 agencies and offices with nearly 100,000 employees. 
And the Agricultural Marketing Service, or AMS, is an agency that administers programs to create domestic and international marketing opportunities for U.S. producers of food, fiber, and specialty crops. So the AMS also provides the agricultural industry with valuable services that ensures quality and availability of food for consumers across the country, uh, as well as exports to international markets. So these services include facilitating the strategic marketing of agricultural products, and it ensures fair trading practices and promoting a competitive and efficient marketplace. And they're constantly working to develop new marketing services to increase customer satisfaction. And some examples of these would be quality standards, grading, uh, certification, auditing, and inspection. And these are voluntary tools that the industry can use to help promote and communicate quality to consumers and assist businesses in differentiating themselves from their competition. And we're all familiar with some of these standards when we go grocery shopping, for example, um, compare prices across USDA grades, including USDA Prime, Choice, Grade A, and US number one. And annually, the AMS grades, audits, and certifies and inspects over $150 billion worth of agricultural products. And this is really designed to ensure the quality of domestic goods and helps American farmers and businesses export their goods. Okay, next slide, please. So let's take a little bit deeper look at the AMS's growing responsibilities over the last couple of years. The United States Warehouse Act authorized the Secretary of Agriculture to license warehouse operators who store agricultural products, and it's administered under the AMS. So in order to participate and get licensed, these warehouse operators have to apply and ultimately meet the standards of the USDA. Uh, the application of the program is voluntary, but the applicants agree to be licensed under the USWA while observing licensing rules and also paying the associated user fees. So, you know, if you think about the AMS, it's, it's kind of like the FDIC for corn, right? Where depositors can make deposits in grain storage facilities and then use that commodity storage as collateral. And what this does is it creates market stability that's backed by the US government. And in 2017, the Agriculture Secretary announced a realignment of a number of offices within the USDA. The Grain Inspection, Packers and Stockyards Administration, and several program areas from the Farm Service Agency, the FSA, joined the AMS to better meet the needs of farmers, uh, ranchers, and producers in order to improve customer service and maximize their efficiency. So with this realignment, it was clear that providing top level services to the USDA's customers would really need a complete rethinking of how the AMS was operating their warehouse commodity management division services or WCMD. Uh, this division includes about 85 employees with 40 working in the field doing site inspections and similar offsite work. Okay, next slide please. So this rethinking created the Electronic Warehouse Commodity Management Division System Project, or EWCMD. And the project incorporated several primary goals at once uh, and ultimately succeeded in accomplishing these objectives that were set out for developing a brand new system, as well as completely different ways of doing business. And uh, you know, these foundational objectives really centered in these areas that we show on the slide. And we're all tackled in parallel, which uh, is anyone can appreciate with this type of very large transformational project. It was pretty challenging in taking on this level of change for the organization. Okay, next slide, please. So for the project, the AMS partnered with Veracity Consulting as their business consulting, systems development, and integration partner. Uh, Veracity is based in Kansas City, where the AMS is based, and was established in 2006. We're a ServiceNow Premier Partner, and we're focused on implementation, configuration, and customization of the NOW platform. We use NOW Create methodologies and standards, and we work across federal, state, and local government, and commercial markets, uh, as well as across multiple verticals, including banking and insurance, utilities, trans uh, transportation, healthcare, and others. So for this project, 
we focused on utilizing the ServiceNow app engine and integration hub to build out a modern, secure, and flexible cloud-based system that would ultimately address the unique business process needs and workflows for the USDA WCMD. So let's, uh, let's take a look at where we came from and how the project unfolded. Next slide, please. Okay, well, I, I've got to warn you um, that what you're about to see could be potentially very disturbing. Next slide, please. <gasps> yes, paper. <laughs> lots of paper, lots of files, folders, and warehouses full of boxes uh, and paper. It kind of makes you wonder if they used a grain cell, I would store all this stuff. <laughs> but with all that, there was... Uh, something of a method to this madness. Uh, for example, the top row shows an examination file. Uh, the middle row, sh uh, row shows the licensing files uh, that they captured all the licensing information to ultimately get the grain operators licensed. And the bottom is where things that got physically mailed out back and forth. And the brown folders are the storage agreement files. And we'll get into a little bit more detail on that. Next slide, please. So it wasn't completely paper-based, but we did need to deal with several legacy systems that handle licensing, grain storage contracts, uh, financial review documents, and, and the like. So let's walk through uh, a bit what those systems were and some of the challenges that the AMS experienced in using those systems. So we were joking around about COBOL. Uh, their primary mainframe system was called GEMS, and it went into to production in 1984. And it was a COBOL-based mainframe system with applications that were considered pretty stable running. So no development investments were made uh, in that system over a very long period of time. And ultimately, the estimated replacement cost for that those legacy applications in that system was on the order of $130 million back in 2015. And originally, the EWCMD project was supposed to be a custom Java-based application written from the ground up. And several other system-like components were developed over time in-house in Kansas City at the AMS, including a Delphi-based system for examinations. Uh, they also had a control book and field product that were developed in-house by the FSA and included distributed databases that had a, a pretty high degree of potential for data loss. Um, it was an access database based system that was really created as a workaround for adding accessibility to data out in the field, but it ultimately created a shadow IT type situation, uh, mainly because the, the databases were stored on a shared network drive, which was slow to access information over a VPN and created data quality issues such as versioning, uh, data loss and security issues, basically because there was no security role-based access controls at all. And uh, you know the way they characterized it to me was sometimes access just forgot dates. I mean, it's not a human. So when something got messed up, there was no system level support to fix it. And the FSA IT team knew these systems existed, but they weren't on any list to maintain or manage at all. And you know, certainly one of the biggest challenges that we tend not to think about anymore is the mainframe system had limited availability from between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. So anything that needed to happen outside of those hours, I mean, folks were just completely out of luck. So all of this quasi-rogue infrastructure was risky from a data and security perspective. For example, if somebody fat fingered a record, the data would just evaporate. And the USDA liked to say that it was all held together with hope and bubblegum. <laughs> If you're from the Midwest like me, we like to say it's held together by bailing wire and duct tape. <laughs> so in essence, these systems were expensive, inefficient, and stovepipe. So really all the bad things you, you could imagine. All right, the next slide, please. So you can probably appreciate the effort it took to manage these legacy systems and make sure the process is moving along to actually get the work done. And here's how it used to look along with the systems in play and the timeframes it took to do this process. So a warehouse would call in or email or whatever communication mechanism they used when they wanted to get a license and get an inspection done. So they emailed in a form 
then the AMS emails it back or emailed it back and checked it off on a Word document list. Uh, this then generated other paperwork for the financial review to meet the requirements. And the paper gets printed out and returned and licensing verification paperwork then had to be routed to a branch chief for final verification. So essentially each person involved in the process would check a box along the way on that Word document as the license issuance process uh, moved along. And the examination assignment in the field could take anywhere from hours or up to several weeks with several components mailed to the examiner, including a printed out Excel file. So essentially the examiner had to wait for the physical mail. And if you were an examiner in the field and you knew you, you basically knew you had work if you got mail, which is pretty exciting, huh? <laughs> Another thing is, there was no transparency within the process or insight or analytics available. And so any information that was needed had to be tracked down for multiple people to find an answer. And this involved literally picking up the phone. So they couldn't do it strictly within the office because field examiners were scattered all over the country. So in totality, this whole thing could take up to 60 days uh, to do the process. Okay, next slide, please. So in order to transform the whole process, it, it really took a good amount of valuation, planning, and really thinking through what was really important to the workflow and how to get started. Or as we like to say, what's the best way to eat an elephant? One process at a time. So the project kicked off with ServiceNow in 2018 and really hit the ground running because you know, one of the very important advantages in using a low code, no code platform is that it vastly reduces the time to start coding and building an application. You don't have to wait for standing up a server, developing the infrastructure and planning all that out up front. You get started having all the ServiceNow instances in place uh, so you can get your logins and be ready to go at a much faster speed. Our project team included several ServiceNow certified developers and architects to build the solution. And it's a custom scoped application using the Now platform, including App Engine and Integration Hub, uh, which is now known as Automation Engine. And, and another item of note is that really no development or integration was done uh, that was incorporated back to the core product areas, such as ITSM, ITOM, or ITBM. So, it truly is a unique standalone application, which is with a pretty significant footprint with over 700 tables that were developed. And the project used a phased approach with an agile methodology. And we delivered smaller batches of functionality with each sprint. So this ended up improving efficiency within the project team relative to time and resource utilization. And we used uh, really frequent, often weekly functionality demonstrations to get AMS's feedback during the development process. And that ended up reducing the rework and increased testing efficiency, as well as user adoption at launch. Some of the major milestones that we hit uh, using this phase development approach included control book initial launch, that was followed by storage rates launch, and finally storage contract invoicing. And we also incorporated several integrations to other systems and data sources. So in partnering with the USDA, the development team took the opportunity to improve processes and even eliminate some that turned out to be not necessary. And that had the benefit of creating a, a much higher sense of motivation for the project and anticipation for the new system to go online. Okay, next uh, slide, please. So where did we end up? Well, we took the entire process down from 60 days to 30 minutes. I mean, think about that, 60 days to 30 minutes. And at a glance, if you look at the process, it looks kind of the same on paper, and that's kind of a unintended. Um, but everything about it is, is completely different behind the scenes, and particularly from the user experience. So the next few slides show some of that user experience process and workflow, and I'll turn it over to Joe to walk us through how that works. Yep. So. <clears throat> So Brian mentioned the Word document that kept getting passed around and all of the different checkboxes that had to be made. And in the new system, everything starts and ends with this license action. And on the license action, it's a little bit hard to tell, but all those white uh, colored fields kind of in the center of the screen there, those each represent one, what would have been a checkbox on that Word document. 
the license action itself is the intake. And this used to be done through the mainframe. So the license application from a, a participant could have come in via email or Word document or even a phone call. And originally the intake would then have to take place via the mainframe. And Brian mentioned uh, the, the windows of operation. It was, it was shut down in the evenings on Friday and be down all weekend. Um, so you had limited availability to even input the, uh, uh, the information. Since ServiceNow is open 24-7, uh, 365 and sometimes 366, um, you can fill this in as you need. And uh, everyone has vis visibility that from, of this from the very beginning all the way to the very end. So that's the license action. This is the input screen and how the license uh, issuance request first gets started. And then into the next slide. The examination request, um, this is actually what then kicks off either the financial review, which would have been the very next step in the original process. And once the financial review gets um, selected, automatically a task gets routed over to the financial branch. So the initial form was filled out by someone in the licensing branch, the finance branch got involved by the examination request, which was automatically created. And in the financial review process, uh, someone, uh, a specialist in the finance, finance branch simply has to make sure that they meet minimum requirements. They'll do a full financial review separately, but they have to make sure that they meet minimum requirements so that they don't waste anyone's time in the examinations branch, because that's where they actually send someone out uh, boots on the ground to a facility to inspect the, uh, the actual location. So the financial review gets checked. There's a box in there for that. And then there's also two examinations checkbox that indicates that an examination is needed. And then we go on to the, uh, the next screen, please. So the financial review is uh, working from here. Uh, only members of the financial branch can view this particular screen. And then there's also separate work behind the scenes that they do. But once they're done with their financial review, they check the box that says meets minimum here. They save and complete this record. And then the workflow automatically processes, uh, progresses into the examination. And the next slide. So the examination gets sent over to the examinations branch where a supervisor reviews it, uh, gets everything prepped and assigns it out to an examiner on that table slide, that picture that you saw that all the files on the top row, none of that happens anymore. Uh, an examiner gets assigned this, this examination. They get an email notification letting them know that it's been assigned. And, uh, and then they work from there. And then this examination, of course, has lots of forms uh, representing all those different files that you saw on the table. But they work on all of this through their, their laptop. And so they show up on site, they go to each of the different grain bins or silos or flats or whatever the different, different uh, types of containers they have there. They review all of their records while they're there. Uh, they do all of the same work that they used to do in the past, except they're no longer having to enter it into uh, uh, paper or Microsoft Access or into their Delphi app that they had to uh, had to use as well. So they continue and they do their examination. And then once they are done with the examination, it would revert back to the license action, which is getting updated all along the way here. And that gets back to the license branch and the license branch can then decide if they're going to issue this license or not. And once they issue the license, it's all done. Everyone has visibility into the system all along the way, which is why uh, at the end of the um, the of uh, the analysis we no longer needed an approval that was one of the steps we originally had we were able to eliminate because the visibility was there and the advantage of having having everything in the same system mm -hmm. allowed us to improve the processes and one of the outcomes of that is the ability to create dashboards so i'll throw this back to brian all right thanks Joe. yeah so really to add to all that from a user experience standpoint um, the ams was able to easily create something that didn't really exist before in any sense which is the executive dashboard. And uh, it provides real-time process flow insights uh, to gain visibility into the status of the, the examinations as they go along, uh, as well as evaluate performance of auditors in the field and what they're doing. So uh, this particular dashboard is the top level one that's uh, viewed by the leadership team, including six of the top level executives. And then additionally, uh, the executive analytics components also feature additional dashboard sets for other people in the AMS organization. Um, and those are shared and distributed according to role-based content yeah, that's relevant to their particular group and function. So th this wasn't something that had to be custom built at all. It was configured by the a AMS themselves and using really the tools inherent to the ServiceNow platform. So 
you know, this is a great example of speaking to the capabilities inherent to the platform and the power of low code, no code based features out of the box. We didn't need to custom build or license any separate analytics or dashboarding solution on top of the now platform. It's all built in. Okay, next slide, please. So if you look at the project from a financial metric standpoint, which you know Derek pointed out that everybody loves to save money, right? Um, especially at the, the management level, there were a lot of efficiencies and hard cost savings that were fairly straightforward to calculate. And as we see here, um, including some of the more dramatic savings, such as saving $130 million on a custom application development project that would have taken a lot longer to develop and ultimately put into production. But some of the savings were a little bit smaller, but not insignificant. Um, certainly things that, that can add up over time, such as the rent for storing physical files, which they calculated to be $25 a square foot for office space. And that equated to around $42,000 annually. Um, but there were a lot of things that didn't go into the cost savings calculations, such as uh, use of printers and cartridges out in the field, uh, the filing time at the home office. Uh, they even uh, sourced out a full-time employee uh, that was budgeted for filing papers and folders and files and then warehousing. So another important area uh, was really the cost of data loss and fixing related issues, which is also really difficult to calculate and quantify. But you know, we think that most importantly, ultimately, it's really the dramatic enhancements to customer service that were ultimately more important. Uh, because you know, Joe pointed out, data could finally be shared uh, as examiners work through their process. And the time it took to troubleshoot issues has dropped dramatically since problems that generally took a week to solve with up to seven people in a room uh, can now be done in a couple of days because everything is in the same system. They didn't have to go hunting around in all these different uh, disparate antiquated systems. So, you know, previously they did a lot of email of, of files back and forth just to get anything done. And all that stuff, again, was outside of the ROI calculation. So it's really hard to put a number on. But you know, everybody at the AMS is abundantly aware that the way they accomplish work is so much more efficient and uh, effective now. And uh, you know, in talking with the AMS, they mentioned that they originally thought that they were special because you know, nobody knows what they do, but they came around to thinking in terms of their business and what their audits entailed, what workflows were involved and what steps had to be done to accomplish their work. And whether dealing with corn or hogs or whatever the case may be, Everything has a process, but it's tough to say that you aren't unique and they were unique just like everybody else. And they really had to get past that idea with the business and really start to tackle big changes so that they could ultimately work better together under one application and one process at a time. So they felt like they had to start with something and make that decision to move forward. And to finally wrap it up, the system won the prestigious AMS Administrators Award, which again points to the incredibly positive impact it's had on the organization and how they function today. Okay, I'll send it back to uh, to Derek. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the uh, the storytelling there. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Fernando, who's going to walk you through the uh, the App Engine development environment, show you some screenshots, and uh, show you how the uh, how the tool works. Uh, the elegance and the power that it, that it's contained. So, hey everyone, my name is Fernando. I am a solutions consultant with the Creator Workflows team, um, and I'm here to kind of give you a little bit of a glimpse as to what App Engine does. I mean, Brian and Joe just mentioned, you know, this is the tool that they use to build these applications and have the amazing results that they just saw, um, and it's specifically using App Engine Studio. And so App Engine Studio is a low-code development tool that is used on the ServiceNow platform that is designed to be very much easy to use and for a huge audience of people, no matter what their technical skill level is. So I just really am excited to kind of give you a glimpse of what's going on. And so let's get into it, shall we? And so once you're here, this is kind of like you're getting greeted into the App Engine Studio. This is kind of like your getting started page. And it really helps you build these applications fast and they can be quickly scaled across the enterprise, um, all while providing kind of very much easy to use interfaces um, that your users are going to enjoy um, working through. And so 
Once we get into kind of the App Engine homepage, as you can see, there's a lot of helpful links um, going from either learning tools, browsing templates, adding any automated workflows, user experiences, and even tables. Um, there's also the kind of section of the, for templates, just kind of displaying all these templates that can be used for these applications on the go, as well as on the top having the banner, you know, where you can access all your applications, even more templates and even more resources to kind of guide you through the journey of creating your own business application. So once again, let's just create our application. So in this case, you know, we're going to start very basic and, you know, the app in your studio is going to really guide you through the process. In this case, we're going to name our um, application, the site security audit. We can even attach a small description to kind of give the users a kind of feel of what's going on with the application, and what it's used for, um, as well as even customizing it with your own personal logo. So while this is doing it, as you can see, there's really no code being um, implemented as of now. So a lot of it, you know, the App Engine Studio is going to really take care of creating that application framework from where you can build your application and then uh, move on for you to kind of uh, get started on setting up your uh, different fundamental parts that compromise the application. And so once we get into kind of the application dashboard, as you can see, there's four different fundamental parts to your application, starting off with data. So the, one of the most important parts of your application is being able to store information within it. And so this is kind of like where the data section comes in. Followed by that, there's also the experience. You want to give your users a really kind of intuitive and understanding experiences. And so this is an easy way to set up how your users interact with your business application. And finally, automation. Like This is one of the most important parts about you know, the workflows that you are um, building. Everyone wants to kind of reduce their process and make everything flow automatically. And so this is where um, that, that part comes in into your business application. And then finally, we also have a security section. You know, no one wants unauthorized access on your application. And this is where you set up those security roles um, in order to kind of have a little bit more control of what's going on within the application itself. So let's get started by adding a little bit of data to our application. In this case, there's several different options. I'm gonna start this case from the right all the way to the left. You can either create a field or a table from scratch. Um, if you were just wanna be you know, fully customizable and start you know, already from scratch, this is the best way to do and create your table. From that, you can also extend from an existing table. Let's say you're working with a very specific type of issue. Um, you can extend from the issue table already existing within the App Engine Studio and just be able to modify either the columns, fields, names, and just customize it without having to recreate the table itself within the system. And then finally, another option is the ability to upload a spreadsheet. Since we've seen that a lot of use cases already track data on spreadsheets, so it just enables your users to work with previous data without having to manually recreate the ta table every single time. And so in our case, we're gonna upload a spreadsheet. As you can see, the data section has now been filled with our audit checklist spreadsheet that has now been converted into a table within the system. Now we're gonna kind of walk through kind of what to create our user experience with in order for users to interact with the application. In this case, we have four different types of experiences that the, the user can have. You can either start with a portal with a lot of kind of like browser-based experiences, uh, just being able to select this is very much a customer portal where you could go in, um, search for anything that your um, any users might have any questions on or have, it'll gather information. Um, from that, we can also have a workspace, which is a one-stop shop for your business users to see all the status of the requests within the system and be able to work on them. This provides um, kind of a single location for everyone or for the business users to kind of interact with what's going on and be able to solve and have more of a high level overview of what's going on within the application itself. From there, we also have the catalog item. So it's just used for users to make any other requests within the application. And finally, we have the mobile um, experience, which kind of gives you know an on the go um, anywhere you can kind of approach and it just gives you a lot more user friendly on the mobile app experience. And in our case, we're going to use a mobile experience for our application. As you can see, the experience has now been filled in with a site security audit. Um, as of now, you can kind of see that you have no real interaction with any coding whatsoever. Everything has been very much a click 
process throughout that the App Engine Studio kind of guides you through. Um, and finally, we're going to get to one of the most important parts, which is automating your workflow. And so to start off, you can either create your workflow from scratch and just customize it as much as you want. And we'll touch a little bit of base on it when we kind of approach the flow designer section um, in uh, this presentation. But for now, as you can also see, there's already some pre-made templates for these workflows that involve third party uh, integrations. You can see that there's Twitter, Teams, Slack, Gmail, Zoom, Excel Sheets, Google Sheets, and even Jira. So a lot of these third-party integrations have already been enabled within the App Engine Studio that you can interact with in order to kind of make your process a lot more, uh, a lot less manual labor intensive. You want to have that focus on being productive and eff efficient as possible. And so now that I kind of showed you these, the three main sections of the application, I also want to give you a little bit of a glimpse as to what's going on when you use an application template. So once we're back in the home page of the screen, as you can see, we're going to select one of these pre-made templates uh, for these applications. These are templates that have um, already a business application embedded within them. So it kind of gives you like a very much a quick start to what's um, going on in order to get your business application up and running. Um, as well as providing very much a lot of documentation. You know, it gives you an idea that covers many of the use cases, how to kind of improve on the app. It gives you information on the roles, the data, and how you can best optimize this pre-made application to kind of fit your needs. And one of the best parts of it is just being able to kind of either use it as is, or in this case, we can modify it as much as we want in order to fit our organization's needs. And so, as you can see, once we selected the um, emergency application, the emergency alert uh, template in this case, um, a lot of the data is experience automation and even the security has been pre filled for us. So it kind of gives it that jump start into creating that application and be able to modernize it as much as we want. Um, in this case, data has already four tables within it. We can only see three here, but there's four tables. The experience has three different experiences. And finally, there's already 13 different automated workflows within the template itself. And so to kind of give you a little bit more of a glimpse as to what it is to interact with a table within um, the App Engine Studio, uh, here it is. Um, and to kind of guide you through the process a little bit, you can see from starting from the left, the column label just gives you a little bit more of a user-friendly name to kind of identify and be able to determine what the column is, followed by the column name, which is what it would look like on your database if you were using one. And one of the most important parts to kind of reference is the type. Um, there's very already out of the box, many different types that you can use, whether it's true or false, date, time, string, a choice, and even the reference. So in this case, when you already have a table within the system, you can always make a reference to it and kind of avoiding that duplicative process of recreating tables every time you need them and accessing that very much important data that you guys already have. And so, as I mentioned previously, you can, when we're working with automated workflows, we are also talking about um, flow designer. The flow designer within the App Engine Studio really lets you customize how your workflow uh, environment works. Um, and all of this is, you know, drag and drop. There's really no coding involved at all. Um, and just being able to kind of easily and intuitive understand how a flow and look at how a flow works uh, within your process. As you can see, you can, we, once we see the, the actions, you know, in this case, it's looking up for a status report request record, right? And if, you know, the status indicates that it's a success, it'll either update the re uh, report request record if it finds one, otherwise it'll create a new request record with the status of success. So one of the big things I want to highlight about App Engine Studio is just the ease of access. It's a low-code platform. Anyone, um, no matter what their technical skill level is, can jump right onto it and be able to solve those business issues that you're struggling with. And so if anyone has any kind of potential questions, please put them in the chat and then I'm gonna pass it over to Derek. Thank you very much, Fernando. Um, looks like we're gonna come in right about, uh, right about an hour or so. Um, thanks to Brian, Joe, Fernando, Heather, Chris for answering stuff in the chat. I did put in the chat the link to the uh, App Engine 
Management Center video. Actually, we have a lot of videos out on YouTube. If you wanted to go look at uh, RPA Hub, which is a new capability for us, there's a seven minute video out there, a nine minute video out there on that as well. Very informative, very quick to, to, to look up and, and view. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll provide a copy of this deck uh, to anybody who requests it. Uh, I will caution you that it's uh, even squeezed down into a PDF, it's still six meg. So uh, some of your email systems out there might uh, might not be able to receive it that way, but we'll find a way to get it to you. Um, any other, I see one question did pop up. Gotcha, okay. Um, anything else we can answer? Any questions from the crowd regarding the product? Um, a lot of you may be on our San Diego release, Tokyo, it's coming out now. Um, as you know, we name our platform releases after major cities of the world, uh, but we have improvements and increased capability every time we turn out a new release, more, more spokes and integration hub, more bots in RPA hub, and uh, App Engine Management Center will continue to get more powerful as we move along as well. So I, again, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to spend with us. We look forward to hearing from you, and uh, we'll be doing this periodically. Uh, because we have so many, so there's so many feature improvements in each uh, release of the platform. We want to keep you informed. So thanks to Kerasoft for hosting. Um, thanks again to all my co-hosts for all your uh, all your information and your explanations. And uh, we look forward to hearing from y'all. Thank you very much for your time.